So recently me and Joe Thayus, who is making Infinawar, had a chat uh, about game dev uh, in general and just some of the things surrounding the game dev industry right now. And of course, we are talking specifically about indie game dev. Joe is making Infinawar, which is a RTS that is inspired by World in Conflict. So a few times in the chat, I say that I will link to his game. Um, I'm going to do it now. Uh, just because it's the start of the video, people actually see this part of it. So his game is going to be on the screen and it will be in the in the section below as well. And of course, uh, check out my game, Operator 8, which is a Doom-like uh, sort of Riddick-like game. If you like those kinds of horror space FPSs and check out Joe's game as well and tell him I sent you. So, Joe, it's good to speak to you again for the second time. Uh, hopefully we can have another riveting conversation. I enjoyed the last one. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to try my best to not talk over you because um, I noticed in the last conversation, maybe because of the, you know, the delay between our locations, yeah. that there was... Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try my best, but I can't promise anything there. Yeah, um, I think that's also to do with, so I recently moved to another state, uh, well it's not called states here, uh, it's called provinces, but I moved to another province uh, across the country, and I've actually, I moved to a more rural province, but I've got a much better connection now, so it might be better, and uh, so far I haven't, I haven't heard any issues, um, but I am also kind of sick, um, getting a little bit of a, of a, of an itch uh, in my throat, so might cough here and there and you said that you might as well so to the listeners just excuse us if that happens yeah i i was sick last <clears throat> week and i don't think i am anymore but allergies or fire season or something here is really so yeah i got mm -hmm. a gi giant bottle of water here so hopefully mm -hmm. that'll be enough and i won't run out yeah i should do that next time um <clears throat> yeah so uh i wanted to get straight into into the chat because uh, I only have about an hour today. So, um, okay. To get started, um, you recently had a devlog that I saw that did really well, and uh, you know you've been doing a lot of work in your game. So, if you don't mind, just um, let everyone know what's been happening and just catch us up on that. Yeah, uh, devlog five was huge, and honestly, I've got to thank you for the idea here um, because before before I put out devlog five. Um, you know, my first devlog got a decent amount of traffic. I think a fair amount of that was just because Mark Brown's face was on the thumbnail. Mm -hmm. You know, sorry, <laughs> sorry, not sorry <laughs> um, for that. Um, but then, you know, they kind of each each one sort of progressively got a little bit less viewership. And I think that's kind of natural. Um, if you look at most channels, like they have like maybe a big first devlog where they introduce a concept and then the subsequent topics aren't are, are more specialized and aren't as interesting or aren't as widely interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Or maybe people just feel like, oh, well, I can't watch that because I haven't watched from the beginning. So people start at the beginning and then they don't get all the way through like a funnel. Um, so my my fourth devlog did poorly, uh, like less less well than I was hoping. Yeah. Um, I think the topic was just too specialized or, um, you know, something like that. Yeah, that could um, be. YouTube has, I sometimes wonder if, like, we get only a limited amount of possible successes with YouTube in a given time frame. Because it sometimes feels like I would, I would, because I run multiple channels, but I would do. I would put in a lot of effort and then I would get like 60 views. And then on another channel, I would do something like just record talking to the camera and it would get like 2K views. And it can be pretty frustrating. Yeah, it does seem a little uh, capricious in a way. Um, so after the after the sort of, I wouldn't say failure, but just the a disappointing fourth devlog where I had put more time and effort than I ever had before in terms of scripting and editing and you know all that stuff um to get you know a, a significant fraction of the previous views that i was getting um like the trend was worrying mm -hmm. so um i mean it wasn't that worrying because i was like well you know i'm my main goal is to make a game is not to make a youtube channel the youtube the youtube channel is just a vehicle to get people aware of the game um, so I was yeah. like, well, oh, you know, okay, it's, it's not the end of the world. It is what it is. Um, 
but uh, so I was kind of kind of thinking of like how can I change things up? Maybe maybe the topic is too um, is too narrow. Maybe I'm going too slow because the other thing that I had been sort of realizing was um, I started my devlog um, sort of in the past where yeah. I was talking about stuff I did two years ago and it wasn't talking about the current uh, the current game. So the the game had vastly eclipsed. Uh, what I was talking about in the devlogs, and I had so much cool stuff I wanted to get to, but I realized that at the pace I was going, it's it was like, well, I'm not going to be able to talk about any of the really cool stuff that I'm doing until like at the pace I'm making the devlogs, like a year or two from now, like this is not going to work. Yeah. So I just had to pivot, uh, and I decided, all right, fast forward to today, let's talk about what what I'm actually doing, um, and getting back to why I need to thank you for the idea. Um, the the devlog that you had about um uh, i don't think it was named at that point the gravebane curse um mm -hmm. uh where it was i'm making a kingsfield clone and mm -hmm. that devlog did very well for you um and i thought well maybe i could do something like this just like the concept of hey i'm making a game that's inspired by x you yeah. know fans of x you know gather to me um yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, I'm, it's I'm, it's not like I'm the first person to do it. You know, it's just basically banking on nostalgia, and I think you can find quite a lot of success that way. Um, I also think it's we'll get into this later on, but I also think it's the reason that my my new side project, the devlog, didn't do well is because that nostalgia doesn't exist yet for the project that I was banking on, which is Brotato in this case. So it's it's a technique to get people to be interested in something that they already had interest in. Um, so an example of that is like I, so it's been Gamescom and all of that stuff, and I'm not good at keeping track of you know, these festivals and all of that kind of stuff. But sometimes you'll see a game pop up. And, and for me, it was, um, I think it's a new Fable game. Um, and I saw, it was something like, maybe it just said Fable 4 or something like this. And I just got like a really excited feeling. And it's a funny thing, because you don't know if the game is going to be good or bad or anything. But it's just that, you know, that familiar feeling um, of games that you enjoyed as a child. So I think, you know, all it really is, is just banking on, previous experiences that people have had yeah it's kind of a, like a hopes and vibes kind of thing of just you see something you're like oh i want this to be good yeah you know you, you don't know anything about it but it's a pro you know a property you like or it's a it's a sequel or even a um a spiritual sequel to something that you really liked and you're like i don't even see any proof that it's going to be good but hope is enough mm -hmm. um so I, I think i definitely tapped into that a little bit um, I didn't realize how much of it there would be. I was a little surprised. Um, okay. You, so, how much nostalgia, or what do you mean? Yeah, how much nostalgia there was. Like, I knew I had it, but, you know, m anytime you're talking about games with people, you know, everybody has their, like, you know, the big names that everybody likes. You know, everybody loves Zelda. Everybody loves Mario. Everybody loves, you know, like, these are the things that people have, you know, they grew up with in their childhood. Um, not a lot of people are talking about world in conflict at least not but when you get an audience as big as the internet or a potential audience as big as the internet you know you can find a, you know a bunch of weirdos like you and then it turns out there's a lot of them um mm -hmm. so yeah De devlog 5 ended up being you know doubling the rest of my views of all the other devlogs combined yeah so like that that scale um you know uh, it pushed me over the edge to the YouTube partner program. So like I can, there's a bunch of stuff that unlocks on YouTube now that I can, that I can do That's cool. um, potentially to support the channel. Um, a ton of new subs, like it doubled my sub count in, you know, yeah. about a month or less than a month. Yes. Um, and the video is still getting views over a month later, like hundreds of views a day, which is not what any of the other devlogs have done. They all kind of, after a few uh, days or weeks, um, you know, they, they eventually get to the point where it's, you know, a trickle of views a day, you know, maybe half a dozen or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but this one is still, is still going strong. And I think tapping in the, into the nostalgia was a big aspect of that. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully I don't get busted by, uh, Ubisoft someday for having a logo in my thumbnail, but <laughs> maybe no, I'm I, small enough to still f yeah, fly no. under the radar. I think um, you would need to be uh quite big to for that to be a, a problem 
Yeah, I mean, I can always change the thumbnail, but there's, you know, there's evidence. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully I can fly under the radar there. And speaking of flying under the radar, um, I think actually the, uh, um, the F-117 Nighthawk that's on the thumbnail was at least, may maybe not, but it was probably 80% the, the WIC logo, um, but a little bit the, you know, sort of charismatic, photogenic F-117 kind of looks cool and intriguing. Mm -hmm. So I think that played a role too. And um, uh, it kind of made me reconsider some of my art objectives, short term, medium term and long term of, uh, you know, some of my art assets have been really, you know, just prototyping assets for a very long time. And I'm sort of realizing the marketing benefit of having a few um, sort of iconic, you know, nice looking iconic models that can feature in thumbnails and things like that. Mm. Um, so that has made me reconsider some of those um, uh, and actually start working on some better models. Um, and one of the other things that came up with the devlog uh, before, you know, I, I got, you know, decent numbers of views, a few thousand here and a few thousand there. Um, and, you know, a, a smallish crop of comments, you know, a few dozen comments on each video. And most of them were just, you know, hey, looks cool. Um, you know, yeah. not yeah. not super engaged comments for the most part. Yeah, um, sort of lukewarm. Uh, yeah, I, mostly just like when, when it's small enough, nobody nobody really gives feedback it's just hey looks cool you know I'm, yeah you it's know, more like you're just encourage, encouragement yeah yeah I've which is which well. is nice yeah i don't, I don't want to take away from you know those those early comments and you know some of them of course people people attach to and you, you do get the detailed mm -hmm. um uh, but one thing i wasn't getting at all yet which was worrying to me was criticism mm -hmm. um because you know if if people don't have strong reactions to what you're doing maybe they don't care. That's um, true. And really up until that point, I hadn't gotten any, any detractors, any, um, you know, other, other than a few quibbles about the thumbnails here and there, you know, some people were upset with how I featured Brackies on one of the thumbnails. So I changed that thumbnail to be a little, a little more obvious that, you know, it's not me partnering with Brackies. <laughs> um, That's, why would, why would they be upset about that? That's such a strange thing. I, I think some people, because it was right around the time, I think, that he came back. Mm -hmm. um, I had actually put that devlog out before he came back, so I just thought he was gone forever, like most people did. Yeah, seemed um, that way. Yeah, but then when, like, so some people were like, is Bracky's back? And then, no, he's not. It just, he was part of the inspiration for this video. Like, I thought you could just put people's face on a thumbnail and have it be understood that that doesn't mean they're in the video. It just <laughs> means they're, like, a topic in the video. Anyway, um, yeah, but yeah. so th those are the only criticisms I had gotten in the past. It wasn't really um, like focused on the game, mm -hmm. and that was worrying to me. Um, so that is, uh, you know, not an issue anymore. Um, <laughs> oh, the overwhelming uh, comments on Devlog Five were really positive, and I got a lot of comments, like a lot more than usual. Mm -hmm. um, even like for the number of views that it got, like comments per view was a higher ratio even. Um, so yeah. people were talking about it more than they were in the past. And I think that's probably because I featured the game more front and center again, yeah. or, or not again, instead of the way I had been doing it in the past, which was sort of like a, a history lesson of how the, how the game came to be, mm -hmm. um, which is still interesting, but interesting to a smaller audience, I think. Um, so yeah. because I was yeah, putting... I because I was putting the design and the plan of the game front and center, I think that made it more interesting to talk about. So more people engaged with that. Yeah, I think it's it's sort of like, um, you know, if if you are if you see yourself as your audience for a second, um, you know, when 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 you see a game that you find interesting, uh, you have to think: Do you care about the person creating the game, or do you care about the game? Um, so I think that's sort of what it comes down to. It's, I think there is a subsection of people that, you know, the sort of personal stuff and the personal journey, that stuff is interesting to. But what I find as well is usually those people are other developers, which isn't necessarily going to be your target audience uh, if you want to make some real money, um, which, you know, ultimately we all want to do. So I think it's interesting to sort of be able to divide those. And I think you will be able to see those in the comments. Um because I don't know if we're going to get to it in this chat, but I want to talk to you about marketing and stuff like that as well. Um, things that I've been doing recently, um, 
you know, feeling a little bit more jaded about game design and, and starting to treat it more like a job rather than a, mm. you know, uh, not a hobby, but something that, you know, is passion first and more something that is becoming um, survival oriented, if I can put it that way, because at some point for it to be a career, it has to become a career. Um, and that sounds stupid, but it's the reality. It's, you know, you can't just make a couple thousand dollars a month forever you at some stage you need to make real money to be able to hire people and make a big team and obviously i know you're not at that point with your game and your situation is a little bit different because you are supporting yourself with a job um but i guess the question is you know if if the game is successful uh would you you know be interested in sort of making it the kind of thing where you then use that as a launching pad to start your own studio or is that or do you always want to go the the indie route with all of the games oh man yeah that's a big that's a big question it's probably too early for me to answer that exactly i'm more at the stage of um like you said i have a full-time job so i'm doing all this stuff just you know nights and weekends when i have time um mm -hmm. Uh, which is, uh, it's a tough pace to keep up because, you know, when you work all day and then you're like, all right, time to work some more. Um, and, you know, when does the rest of life happen? Yeah, um, and, you know, and you have you have family and you have friends and you have, you know, pets and responsibilities. So it's just interesting to me to see that dynamic um, because I, the, the main reason I'm asking that is because you said um, when, when you were able to join the partner program, uh, you mentioned that it would help uh financially support the channel and support your endeavors so it's interesting to me to know that you know is there a financial separation between being a game developer as a hobbyist and you know your professional life uh or is it the the sort of thing where eventually that you know you would merge them i guess is what i'm getting at and this isn't specifically about your game it's just about where yeah. you see yourself as someone you know i'm just sort of drawing some some uh comparisons between the sort of developers that we are yeah um it's it's definitely evolving um and some of this also has to do with a topic i'm not going to go into significantly which is uh the full-time job um you know the mm -hmm. the market is tough right now so you know i'm evaluating my my current career path and you know i've been doing web development for uh like like 15 years now almost and i'm like do i want to keep doing that mm -hmm. um you know like if i had to pivot now would i still do that um maybe not and if i was going to pivot when would i do it what stage of my life would i do it and maybe now is the time um maybe now i've got a bit of financial runway where i could take a risk like that um yeah but I think it's yeah, it's it's interesting to me as well because I think a big difference as well is you know, uh, you being an American, it's also it's you have to look at it differently because the uh, cost of living is a lot higher for someone in that part of the world. Yeah, and I live in the Bay Area in California, so it's even worse than normal. Like, there's places in the U.S. where you can you can live relatively inexpensively, uh, not where I live right now. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, um, that that is also another consideration. Yeah, and I is mean, I ha no, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, like, part of, like there's sort of a mutual. I have this Bay Area tech job, sort of, and I have this Bay Area um, uh, cost of living, and they're kind of linked. So if Bay Area tech job goes away, what happens to Bay Area lifestyle, Bay Area cost of living? could mm -hmm. could get uh, could get a little dicey so that that's a consideration as well like most of the time if a if a, an indie game developer to bring it back to uh you know game development if they are thinking about you know going independent and quit or quitting their job or whatever they're one of the things that comes up a lot is they move somewhere that is cheaper mm -hmm. and i don't really want to do that right now for reasons i won't get into um yeah so i'm kind of stuck in the you know need some you know real job to support myself and you know what i what i do um but then also want to make this game and mm. it's it's important to me to make this game at this point um like i'm so far into it 
uh not in a not in like a um uh what is it the gambler's fallacy what is what's the thing i'm thinking of good money after bad you know what i'm talking about um I, not I, in that sort of way like oh geez you know now i'm stuck doing this it's more like the deeper i get into it the more yeah i know what the you more mean. i want to yeah uh -huh. um and the more the more my brain has warmed up to the idea of taking big risks like like what if like what if we tried this thing? Like how many wish lists do I need now? Um, yeah. You know, how long could I go and and experiment? So bringing it back to like YouTube partner program type stuff. Um, uh, you know, I, I I turned on um, you can you can run ads on your videos. That'll probably annoy some people, but um, you know, no, uh, it's an no experiment. Idea at this yeah. point yeah um and it'll, it'll probably make pennies honestly yeah. like for a while uh, it's a little bit of a bummer that youtube doesn't retroactively pay you for you know watch time um yeah it I, is, I guess but it makes I, sense because, i get it from their perspective as well yeah because they weren't uh, i th i guess somebody said that they don't run ads on on non um monetized content yeah um, i figured youtube was running ads on my stuff anyway um and i just wasn't getting any i just wasn't seeing any of it um, but I guess that's not how it works. So that's rather interesting. Yeah. And, you know, just to uh, just to make this point, um, the reason I'm talking about this at all is just because, you know, most of the people that are going to watch this and obviously these sort of videos don't get big numbers, but to the, you know, two or three hundred people that, that are going to see this, most of them are going to be developers um, at this point. And maybe this is something that grows over time. But um, and so it's just interesting to me to have these conversations with other developers where, um, obviously the game is important and maybe a few people see the game and wishlist it from this but it's important to have the conversations where other developers maybe ones that are a little bit younger than we are um, can sort of see you know uh, what is not necessarily needed but the sort of life that uh, you know contrasting lives that people can have with video game development um, and it's a it's a difficult thing to do so I think it's just interesting to talk about this um, but pivoting from that you mentioned how many wish lists you would need uh from from steam and i do want to talk a little bit about steam as well um so you know to get back onto your game then um have you seen an uptick in wish lists or uh well actually um i think you you mentioned your 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 steam page might be going live now right oh it is live now um so yeah thanks thanks for uh bringing us to here so i did put the steam page up okay um part of the reason was i got so many people on devlog 5 in in the comments asking where's the steam page where's the steam page i want I, you know i went to search for it and i didn't find it where is it mm -hmm. um so i because i didn't have one yet and i do wish that i had gotten the steam page up sooner because then you know i have this this big devlog that does well um i could have you know, sent all the, all these people to get to you know, yeah, uh, definitely to wish list the game, but it wasn't it wasn't ready at the time. It's a it's um, a but, it's a catch me to a little bit because, you know, it's not like you could have known that this devlog was going to yeah. be the one that does this. But uh, you know, to developers listening, it is a lesson in being ready, because I, I heard this thing. I don't know exactly how it goes, but eighty percent of luck is just being ready when when you do get lucky. So you know it's important yeah. to get a steam page up um even if you don't have much to show yet and you know some of the big guys like thomas brush will tell you that but um in this case i'm sure you were able to still get a lot of those guys to then go retroactively and go and wish list yeah yeah i did do a follow-up video like kind of a quick follow-up video on on devlog 5 of like answering the top questions of and one of the main ones was like where's the steam page and like where's the discord and mm -hmm. you know all, all these kinds of things um, still no discord, uh, that'll, that'll be a future thing, but, um, I knew I had to get steam up, up and running, uh, as quick as I could. Um, so I did put together a steam page and that was kind of an interesting experience, um, in itself. Uh, cause yeah, I, I definitely, I didn't know in advance which, whether any video would pop off like it did. And it definitely didn't know that it would be the very next one. Um, so it would have been nice to have it up sooner. Uh, it is tough because you do got to fork over a hundred bucks. Yeah, true. Um, and it's it's a process. To, uh, you you know you've made a ton of Steam pages, mm -hmm. um, especially for your first one where you don't know how to do it or you don't know what's needed. 
and then suddenly Steam is asking you for like 30 different art assets of, you know, different configurations of backgrounds and logos and all this stuff that like maybe you don't have a logo yet. And fortunately, I have a kind of temporary logo that does the job. But, you know, you yeah. start up a Steam page, but then you suddenly realize like, oh, I need background art. I need uh, I need a logo. I need all this yeah, marketing copy. Definitely. I need... And then, you know, all the best practices for making Steam pages, like, oh, I need to record all these GIFs, mm -hmm. GIFs, GIFs, whatever. I call it, I call them GIFs. I'm Team GIF. Um, I think they are called <laughs> GIFs, but GIF is fun to say. It. Yeah. I don't really care it's, so much. I, um, it's, I, I think the original creator calls it GIF, but he has since admitted defeat and says, fine, it's, it's GIF, because that's what everybody says. It's one of those um, internet things that it's really just like, who cares at the end of the day? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so, you know, if you don't mind, um, I'd like to take a moment to speak about Steam Pages, because um, I've yeah. pulled up yours now. Um, oh, okay. And I guess I should do that just to take a look. So this isn't going to be a critique. It's just going to be sort of like a first, because I, I didn't, I haven't seen it yet. Um, intentionally, I wanted to wait until we had the chat uh, to actually see what you did do. And right off the bat, I have to say I'm, I'm quite impressed. Um, and to other developers watching this, um, I will be putting this on. Uh, I'll I'll send a link uh, on the on the screen and in the description so that you guys can can visit and see what he did. But you know, this is a good Steam page right off the bat. And I've had um, a lot of conversations with uh, other developers that haven't made Steam pages yet, but that have wanted to, uh, about what to do. And um, right off the bat, you did a lot of the good stuff already. So um, I don't know what you're, what, and you don't have to tell us, but I'm pretty sure you are getting a, a, a fair trickle of wish lists uh, coming in every day and week. Yeah, uh, so far the the response for wish lists has been great. Uh, I didn't know what to expect uh, day one. I was like, "Am I going to get ten? Am I going to get a hundred? Am I going to get a thousand? Um, I didn't get a thousand on the first day, um, but I did get over a thousand. I, I think there's some NDA stuff, so we can't be. I have to be a little coy about the numbers, or not NDA, but like Steam terms of service stuff where you can't talk about exact specific numbers and stuff like that but eh, um kind, i did, kinda, I did but it's sort of like a gray area they don't really care yeah 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 uh, um, but, but you but don't, I did you get don't have to over a thousand in about the first week which was which was good that's pretty good um and it's it's still going so i've got i think i'm over 1500 now that's, that's which is you know for the first you know it's not even the first month yet so i'm pretty happy with that and it seems to still be going um, and the thing that I was a little bit surprised about is I seem to be getting some regular Steam traffic, like just from Steam recommendations. I had mm -hmm. I had thought that I was going to get no push at all from Steam because it's an unreleased game, um, and that it was all just going to be sort of an endpoint for me to send people to, you know, from the videos from Twitter. Um, but I'm actually getting a fair amount of. Not a lot, but a fair amount more than I thought I would be, which was zero. Of yeah. uh, just Steam recommending or people searching for, you know, people looking for like, man, there's not enough real time tactics games out there. What else is what's up and coming? Like, I've actually had people tell me that that's what they did. They searched for, you know, new or unreleased real time tactics games um, to see if there was anything, and they found my game and they are interested. Um, mm. So it is interesting to see that there's sort of you know, multiple algorithms at play now. I've got the YouTube algorithm, you've got the Steam algorithm. They feed each other a little bit um, in different ways. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't, this is a chat between me and Joe, so I don't want it to be too much of a lesson uh, for other developers. But um, in terms of the Steam page itself, uh, the reason that Joe is getting a little bit of traffic and getting a little bit of wish lists coming in is steam pages are visual things um now joe doesn't have a trailer yet so that'll help in the future but the screenshots are colorful um they show what the game is um the text is not overdone there's not too much of it and it it is pretty specific and it tells you what the game is and what you can do in the game and for me the most important thing is the gifts uh, that joe has put in um, and these are sort of like 
pre-trailers, uh, I like to call them. And I think these are all really important. And I did notice that you are now starting to get a little bit of community feedback. So Steam has this community hub. Um, and so I just like quickly looked at it and I see you did post a news segment. So that's pretty important as well. Mm -hmm. um, so these are all things that, you know, are, are quite good to look at if anyone, you know, is interested in, in doing this kind of thing. But to me, the point is, uh, it seems like a healthy Steam page. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that you finally got it up because um, this is sort of just that cementing uh, of the fact that this is now a game and this is something that you are serious about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you got to put up your hundred bucks and you got to... Um you got to spend the time to put together. It doesn't look like there's that many art assets involved, but like just the logo and background, there's like, there's like, I think 30 or so, or, you know, two dozen yeah, at least. It's hard work. Different, I mean, different I've, formats. I've made about six or seven Steam pages at this point, and it takes a lot of time. And the thing is, you also, you can't skim over it because it's very important to do right. Um, and, uh, you know, the ratio of uh, wishes that you are getting, you know, non-specifically uh, around 1500, I think it's quite good um, because my game Operator 8 has been in development for three years now or something like that. And um, I'm going to be launching um, at the end of the year at some point. I still have to release the the uh, an the announcement for the for the release date uh, is what I meant to say. Um, but for that game, uh, after three years, I'm sitting at about 14,000 wish lists. Um, okay, which, that's which pretty is, good. Which is quite good. Um, but reason being, and we won't spend too much time on Steam, but reason being as well uh, is the fact that I did do one, I think it was the second uh, Steam Next Fest ever. So um, that was when Steam Next Fest just started. And I assume you haven't done a Next Fest yet. No, I think I think it was going on like right as I was launching the Steam page, or maybe just before. Um, and I, yeah, I wasn't wasn't ready for that um, quite okay. yet. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, g give me a personal call before you do do that, so that I can just uh, give you a few pointers. But you can expect about oh, definitely about two to four thousand wish lists for that. That would be that would be nice. Yeah, that's more or less what I think your your game is going to get on a next fest, especially because of the genre and because of the um, the style and everything. It's it stands out because it's something that uh, there isn't too much of right now, and I think it's a good time for it as well. Um, but yeah, okay. Uh, do you have anything else to say about Steam specifically, or do you want to move on to the next point? Um, just just a few things since you know we are we are talking about the Steam page. Yeah. I'd I really do want to get a trailer up. A, tra a, a proper trailer will take some time, but one of the things I need to do in the short term is just get some video clips up that are in that little, the little, I don't know what you call it, the little thumbnail camera roll feed, whatever it is at the top. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just just to get some some motion in there. And from what I've heard from you know the the Steam marketing experts, um, when people are browsing Steam pages, they actually don't watch the trailer for the most part. Um, they'll, they'll click through the thumbnails to try to get a sense of like how does the game play, what is the game like, um, because trailers can often have a bunch of a bunch of stuff that isn't gameplay or you know logos or you know whatever. Um, yeah. So definitely something I need to do uh, is just you know throw up some some gameplay footage. I think would be just fine there and something that would be quick to do. I just haven't done it yet. Um, I should get on that. Um, yeah. And then the other thing, the other the other sort of tip that I had heard and something I tried to follow with like the screenshots that are shown here is um, if your game has different environments, especially that have vastly different color palettes, uh, try to include one of each of those. Like if you've mm -hmm. got like, you know, sort of the typical like fire world, ice world, plant world, you know, green, red, blue, you know, that type of thing. Uh, do that. Yeah. Try not to have um, uh, screenshots that are all the same environment. Um, yeah. or, you know, all the same color palette because you just sort of glance through it and it's like, oh, this game looks like the same in every screenshot. And that is an instant turn off for people. Yeah, it's, um, so, you know, it's really just marketing psychology if you think about it. Um, but yeah. just, to, just to say something about your point about the trailer. So uh, I do think that you are right. Most people don't click on a trailer. Um, but the way that I see it is that a trailer is 
for someone that has made it past the screenshots. So someone that is genuinely yeah. interested in buying the game. Um, and yeah. I don't know what your analytics are like for for uh, just for you know general uh, consumer analytics, but for me, uh, I think the game has had more than six million visits to the page. So if you think about it, fourteen thousand wish lists is a terrible conversion rate. So that means that my job was not done correctly. As you know, I, oh, I, 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 don't, see I don't like marketing, but um, this is something that I'm trying to get better at. So in some way, fourteen thousand wish lists should have been more like a hundred thousand uh, if I did my job better. But you know, we learn and we and we get better. But um, I'm, I just want to say, you kind of do have to look at it that way. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else on the Steam page. I mean, I, we could probably go for an hour on just the Steam page, but I yeah. don't think there's anything anything major left that I wanted to talk about, yeah. about um, Steam in particular. Other than just uh, go to the Steam page, you can search Infinawar um, on Steam and uh, wishlist it, or it it should be in you know links to all the video all of my videos on you know Twitter and everything else on my YouTube channel. It should be easy to find, mm -hmm. uh, with one exception actually the one. Uh, there's there's some name collision with Infinawar, which kind of is a little bit worrying. Um, there's like a ten year old game called Infinity Wars, um, okay. like a Magic the Gathering style card game called Infinity Wars that mm -hmm. was coming up when I was trying to like Google search Infinawar Steam. Um, I'm not sure how they haven't been targeted by Disney Marvel yet. Uh, Infinity Wars sounds really close to Infinity War, um, but you know maybe if they're safe, I'm safe. Um, yeah, There's also an RTS called Infinity War, like just straight up Infinity War. Mm -hmm. um, but it's got like one review, one negative review. So I'm not super worried about that. And I think it isn't under active development. Okay. Um, but then there's also like all the other games, you know, there's Call of Duty, Infinite Warfare. And like, so it's a little bit worrying. I, but, think, um, I think you'll be all right. I think you, you're giving it too much thought. Yeah, I might be. I mean, the, it's really an homage to um, Infiniminer. Uh, Zachtronics made this. Do you know? Do you know this game? Mm -mm. So no it's actually the inspiration for Minecraft. So um, uh, Notch was playing Infiniminer by Zachtronics. Uh, Zach, uh, what's his name? Zach. I can't remember his last name. Um, he makes a bunch of like uh, like automation programmer style games. Okay. Um, Infiniminer. Uh, in, he made Infiniminer. He made Infinifactory. Um, and uh, Infinawar is sort of an homage to uh, to those games, and maybe maybe a little bit of the aspiration of you know I might not be the next Minecraft, but I hope I inspire the next Minecraft. Okay, um, is uh, is is the the story there? That's interesting. Um, and you know, coming up with names is hard, so I had a long <laughs> long think about how to how to name the game, and Infinawar is what I came up with. Yeah, so. it's it's very important, and I've made some mistakes in that department. I mean. One of my games was called Death Rattle Hell Unleashed. It's like, I don't know what I was thinking with that one, but uh, it, it's a it's a cool. I think it's a cool name. I don't know if it ties to the gameplay at all, really, but it's uh Well, um, here's the thing: there better like, be some death rattling in there. That's that's <laughs> the thing. I never knew what death rattling was before I named the game, um, and ah, I didn't okay. even bother to look it up either. I just sort of named it, and then when it was done, I eventually saw what a death rattle was, and it wasn't the prettiest thing to look at. So um you know at least it's it kind of works because uh i wouldn't get too much into it but it's this game where you play as uh sort of like a like a holy warrior that has to vanquish uh hell after the rupture and things like that so but <laughs> anyway um yeah naming is important uh, i'll probably make a video on naming at some point and i do want to make a video about uh, setting up steam pages correctly um, because i think it it's valuable and I, and I do think the landscape has changed a lot uh, a lot of the videos that are out now on that kind of things uh, you know some of the ones that have hundreds of thousands of views um, they are very outdated at this point uh, i think it's it's quite old information and you know the way that wish lists work have changed as well uh, which is something i want to uh, talk about in the future as well but for this video uh, i think we should um we should probably stick to our list yeah because we have been going for uh, 40 <clears throat> minutes apparently oh right you, and you don't have that much time left okay no i i can do like another like 40 minutes or so but i just think we should okay. uh, we should because I, I mean it's it's my fault as well i like to sort of veer off topic quite a lot uh but yeah yeah so check out joe's game um it'll be in the description of this video as well 
uh, and I'll put a little thing uh, where you can go and check it out on the on the video itself as well. But to get back into the uh, into the topics, um, so you mentioned the devlog of my uh, new. Um, it's not really. I don't want to call it my new game because it's sort of just like a little distraction, a little side project. Uh, yeah. Called um, Zombie. Uh, actually, it was going to be called Zombabies, and it was you were going to play as like an infant zombie. But then uh, I don't know. That just didn't work for me. It just I don't know. It just felt weird. Um, so I just made it Zombuddies, uh, which my brother says. You know, Olvin says. Uh, makes it seem like it's a multiplayer game. So I might need to change that in the future as well. So for now, it's just a working title. Oh, yeah, okay. But, but um, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm working on this little side project. It's gonna, just going to take me a couple of months to do, um, which is sort of like a clone of Brotato. I don't know if you've played Brotato. I haven't played Brotato. I have seen it, and I have played um, Vampire Survivors. So okay. it's a similar... Yeah, I think I think maybe Vampire Survivors was first, and Brotato was like a like an evolution of that. Maybe I'm not sure about that. I want to. I do actually want to. I could be wrong about that. I don't know. I do think Brotato is quite old. I, it might be insanely yeah, old. I could actually. be. I could be wrong about that. Okay, it's not that. No, it's not that old. It's uh, 27 September 2022. So, Vampire. It's about the same time then. Let's see. Um, this doesn't give a year. It just says, okay. So Vampire Survivors is about a year older. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you are correct about that. But, um, but the point being that this game will have some, uh, procedurally generated aspects, uh, in it. So I think, so if you look back in my videos, um, on YouTube, uh, I, I made a video a while back about this one game that I'm developing and you know this is a theme I like to work on multiple things at a time <clears> but um, I'm developing a game called The Gravebane Curse and this game uh, I had a big um, so this is the the game of mine that sort of blew up uh, in, in, in YouTube and I think two videos the third devlog um, was about why I decided not to do procedural generation. And of course, that had a lot of good feedback and negative feedback being a criticism uh, for my way of seeing things. But since that time, I've come around to actually studying <coughs> up on procedural generation a little bit and challenging myself as a programmer to try and learn these things and maybe not be too opinionated on something that I don't know too much about. So since then, I've come to enjoy some of the... Um, aspects of it um and so i wanted to just talk about it a little bit um in your opinion does it make for good design and uh is it something that you know you are interested in not necessarily for your own game but just maybe for a future project um yeah so procedural generation is the foundation of infinite war so it's like a huge it's a huge topic in my mind like it's it's so foundational i baked it kind of baked it into the name like the infinity in infinawar is about replayability like, okay it's meant like the name of the game is meant to communicate it's a war game that's replayable mm -hmm. um that and i think a lot of um campaign based war games aren't replayable in that way or aren't as replayable in that way um so yeah that's... i wanted to make it like a first class citizen like it's in the name <laughs> Um, yeah, it's interesting because when when I look at games and and titles, I don't think about them that deeply. Um, I think you have different types of of customers that that look at things differently. But you know, now that you said it, Infinity War, it does seem like it's uh, you know repeating war. It's an Infinity War, so it's interesting to me that I didn't pick up on that. But okay, so like you said, it's a it's a foundational point in your game. Yeah, yeah, like the 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 foundational idea was. I loved World in Conflict. I played it a bunch. I played the multiplayer a bunch. I played the campaigns a bunch. But then, even though I had this sort of like love in my heart for it, I could play it whenever I wanted, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. And why? Um, and part of that was uh, if you play enough of the multiplayer, um, like it's a it's a good game and it's exciting and it's fun. But the meta is pretty stale. Like the game, the matches, even in multiplayer, kind of play out the same way every time. Um, it doesn't help that everyone in multiplayer plays the same map over and over too, even though there's a whole bunch of maps to play. 
um, that's that's a totally different conversation of like why people end up you know why gamers end up sort of optimizing the fun out of their own games of like instead of playing all the variety they just they play the one map over and over because it's the most dense map or or whatever mm-hmm. um, um, and the campaign you can only play it so many times and it's the same every time it's the same twelve you know twelve missions or whatever it is okay um, so I was and I was thinking well. These, there's these other games that I play a lot more that you know keep having something for me to come back to. What's different? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's because World in Conflict isn't designed at all around replayability in that sense. Um, and I okay. never played competitively multiplayer, and I'm sure competitive play is more interesting. It was you know more more public matches, and the public matches always kind of kind of go eventually the same way. After you've played a hundred public matches, you've probably seen most of. Uh, most of what a multiplayer game has to offer. And I think that goes for most, um, you know, sort of random public um, online games. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maybe not 100, but like maybe 200, 500, something in there. Yeah. Uh, But you start to you start to see the repetition even um, even in multiplayer games with a human opponent. Okay. Um, Okay. So in your opinion, it is sort of the sort of thing that you think can add a lot of fun and value to a game. Yeah, and um, uh, the ability to like come back to it, even if you're not playing it all the time. Um, I some uh, so one person expressed in the comments that they were really worried about, um, you know, games that are trying to become your lifestyle, games that are trying to be like take up all your free time. Um, and I totally get that. Mm-hmm. There's a ton of like gross toxic stuff in the game industry especially with live service games where it's like log in every day to get this thing you yeah. know log in to do your dailies and it sounds like chores it sounds like a second job mm-hmm. um, and i'm not trying to make that um, i'm trying to make a game where um you know even if you drop it and don't pick it up for years that you can come back and not just play the same campaign again but play like like i could go back to like an old civilization game for example civilization 2 one of my you know old favorites Mm-hmm. And pick it up and just have a you know a brand new, maybe not entirely brand new. You know the game does have similarities from playthrough to playthrough, but you know a new story to tell, new stuff happens, um, and it would be it would sort of be like old times in a way. Um, That's an interesting. So way I'm to looking to re- looking to recapture that, like something where you could go back and not just replay a thing you already did, but do a new thing. You know, mm-hmm. I'm going to play as this new civilization and, you know, with this, I've never played on this map type. Um, you know, okay. there, there weren't that many knobs to tweak on the old, in the old games, but, yeah. um, yeah. uh, you know, a new, a, do a new run with a new build or, you know, something like that. You know, I, oh, I never played this character type in Diablo. Um, uh, let me go do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's not something that's taking up. You know, every moment of my life for the next, you know, ten years, it's just something that I can pick up again whenever I feel like it and uh, get something get something new and different out of it that uh, I didn't get the last time that I played. So that's that's kind of the high level of what I'm going for, mm-hmm. um, and and why I'm why I'm taking the game in a direction that's pretty different from um, where most other war games are going. Now that said, I have. With a little bit of concern, been noticing some of the, um, you know, like Regiments is a, um, a sort of war game in the in at least a, a close proximity to what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. We're like, oh, hey, they just released a procedural campaign system. Like, uh oh, <laughs> are are the triple A's or double A's at least starting to catch on to this idea that hey, maybe what if we added a roguelike campaign to our war game? Um, but I think for the most part, I'm not that worried about the way those those types of games are going to do those systems because yeah. they're going to do them in a way that's very grounded in reality um, because of the style of game that they're going for. And I don't have to do that. I can be more, I can be more creative and a little more uh, experimental than, than they can. Part of that's to do with the art style. Um, you know, art style sets expectations. If you've got, you know, ultra realistic graphics and you've got a campaign system that does, you know, weird, nonsensical, non-realistic stuff, um, it's kind of a clash, but if you've got, uh, you know, more abstract stylized art style, you can get away with more stuff. Um, I'm going to try to keep it more or less 
grounded, at least in a way that makes sense in my head, but I've got more room to experiment, so I'm less worried about that. Yeah, okay. uh, but getting back on a procedural sense. generation, sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, and if the sort of question is like, does it make for good design, right? Mm-hmm. Like, is it good? You know, sometimes you get people pushing back against it. Um, and I think there's some reasons for that because procedural generation is a tool and like any tool, it can be used poorly. It can be used without skill. It can be used improperly. Um, and I'm not claiming that I'm some kind of master of procedural generation at this point, but I at least have a good idea, I think, of when it when it doesn't work and why. And the the main one, I think, is this idea. I can't remember who coined this term, but like the bowl of oatmeal. If you think of a bowl of oatmeal, you know, you pour the oatmeal in the bowl, you pour in the water, and like, that's all random. All the, like, the, where the grains of the oatmeal, like, how it all fits together, like, mm-hmm. it's all random. It's not the same. But, like, you one bowl of oatmeal to the next, to, like, it doesn't matter that, you know, okay, the grains are rotated differently or whatever. It's all just a big bowl of oatmeal. Who cares? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's where, like, whenever you're in that area of procedural generation where you're, like, here's this random static, this random bowl of oatmeal, but it's just another bowl of oatmeal that... Yes, it's technically different than the first one, but practically speaking, it's the exact same bowl of oatmeal. Yeah, um, effectively, you want to stay. Yeah, you want to stay as far from. Oops. Oh, hopefully that. that hopefully, I didn't. I bumped my mic cord here. Hopefully, you, I'm still recording. Oh uh, yeah, I think well, I, I mean, think I am. Let, let me let me double let me double check. Just make sure. Okay, I still see audio capture, so that's good. Yeah, I see. Um, I see it on your end, on yeah. my end as well. Yeah, so you want to stay as far away from that end of procedural generation as you can. Just because something is random doesn't mean it is interesting. That's um, that's. If I can just take a second on that, that's an interesting thought to me because it's not something that I've heard, um, but it is something that I would need to think a bit about because I I can think of use cases for randomness, but minuscule randomness. Um, you know, effectively something being different each time but not making a difference uh each time so yeah i don't i don't have too much to say on that right now but it is something that i want to think about because it's an interesting point to me um but yeah with that said um it's it's not something that i've heard before but i think it's it's an easy thing to make assumptions uh in in game design um but you know i think a point like that um is something that you can think a lot on you know what i mean um so yeah so i think i want to take some time to think about that point before sort of giving my opinion on it you know what i mean with that yeah 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 Um, Yeah, it's it's something that i've thought about a fair amount um because again the game is mm -hmm. is basically a thought experiment of what if a real-time tactics war game was heavily based on procedural generation. Like, what could you do with that concept? What could you do that the genre hasn't done um, uh, before? Yeah, because I guess you do need to differentiate, right? Like, you don't want to just... You want to be inspired by something, but you don't want to be that thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, There was... there, There definitely have been some people who are like, well, this is just World in Conflict with worse graphics. Why would I play that? Um, and I agree with that sentiment. They're wrong about it's just world in conflict because, like, yeah, the the control scheme, like the the moment to moment gameplay of like I move this tank here, that's really similar. That's intentionally really similar. Mm-hmm. But the higher level decisions, the like the higher level structure of the game, is completely different. Um, so you know, if 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 I was just making, I'm writing my own single player campaign and it plays exactly like World in Conflict. Well, you're probably just going to get a worse story. You're not going to get Alec Baldwin as the voiceover, um, although he's I guess maybe less popular these days because of the incident. <laughs> um, uh, and you're you're going to get you know worse worse graphics. Uh, um, so that game I don't think is worth making. Like just trying to make my own World in Conflict isn't worth making. World in Conflict's already out there. Um, and there's already developers making, um, you know, sort of the next gen, uh, you know, Broken Arrow and things like that. Um, so mm-hmm. I'm not making that game. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, uh, I'm, I'm just curious. Um, 
in that comment that you mentioned, um, was that a YouTube comment or? Uh, yeah, it was. And it's interesting because I got comments on both ends of the spectrum, which was, this is just world in conflict with worse graphics. Why that's not worth playing. Mm -hmm. And this, and the other end was this strays so far from what makes world in conflict great that you can't even say you're inspired by it. That so it's really interesting. interesting to get both extremes and everything in between of, you know, people saying this is too much like World in Conflict, it's not enough like World in Conflict, and everything in between. Um, so I think that's probably good. I think that means I'm probably hitting the right, like, the right spot. Yeah, um, you want to be right in the middle of that. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, that's that's really where I want to position myself. Well, um, you know, the the procedural generation, you know, and whether it makes for good game design sort of bleeds into the next point being... Um, replayability versus narrative because um, my game um, that I'm currently working on releasing uh, Operator 8 it is a linear game um, in that you start at one point you make your way through a section uh, you collect keys whatever to, to unlock the next section and then you know when you finish all the sections you get to the end of the level um, you start the next level and you do it again but there are a lot of uh, sort of like branching routes and branching paths that'll take you to different places um, where there are different things that you can collect and different. So I have this system sort of like Doom 3 where there are these PDAs that have their own little stories um, and some of them are linked and some of them aren't. So if you want to experience the whole narrative, you have to actually find all of these pieces of the of the story. Um, and I do think a very small subsection of players will do that. But it's interesting to me to design this way. Um, and now, of course, this was before my thought process on um, uh, pr procedural generation. But, you know, it's okay for a game to be linear um, as well as being procedurally generated. But, you know, how does... Let's take an example, my game being the linear game that it is, but with branching paths... Um, in what way would procedural generation help my game in that situation? Uh, I think it's it's tough in especially in like a first person exploration based game. Uh, I don't have any, any experience making those, although I do mm -hmm. have experience playing them. I think it is harder to do that well. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it is harder to do that well because the player is so embodied in the space and in the exploration when things are not okay designed with intention in those in that kind of a setting mm -hmm. um it's really really noticeable like you know people i haven't played starfield but i've heard people talking about how the procedural environments there are crap or the way that they did procedural was well you you get like a random you go to a planet and you get like a random outpost but it's the same outpost every time. Like literally the same props are in the same places. The same items are in the same places every time. Like, and like, that's obviously bad. That's just like, they were rushed or something, but would it even be all that much better if the props were random? Like if the environment wasn't, yeah, the, we could probably talk for hours about like the right way to do this. But I think, I think 3d first person exploration, heavy games are I haven't thought about this fully, but like it's definitely one of the harder cases. I don't know if it's the hardest case. Maybe puzzle games are even harder to do procedurally because, like, well, I won't get into that. But exploration based first person <coughs> games are really tough to do procedurally. Mm -hmm. um, you'd, I think you'd have to really think about because we're so familiar with like going into a space as a as a human character and like looking at stuff and picking up stuff like the way a space is laid out all the environmental storytelling and the fact that you're going to be compared against games that are had a huge level design team handcrafted everything um that's not to say that they these that they don't use any procedural tools in the handcrafting like they might be procedurally scattering clutter or what have you mm -hmm. um, to, to fill up a level quickly. and um, But it still has like a designer's eye. So procedurally making a dungeon that's interesting to explore or like a space station that's interesting to explore, I think is a hard problem. Maybe not unsolvable, but it's not, excuse me, not easy. 
Okay, well, that's that's um, an interesting point. I haven't thought about it in that way, but I but I do see what you you know are getting at with that, um, and that basically boils down to it's not whether it's a better system of design it's whether it's better for the genre and uh style of game that you are making yeah like it if it like a, a procedural first person combat game i think that has some because that's very system oriented i think you can make that interesting mm -hmm. if a game is heavy on exploration and like player discovery and things like that i think that is harder to do Okay. I think it could be done, but I think it is harder to do because like the the like part of the joy of discovery is that you know, like No Man's Sky and things like that ran into this where it's like, here's another weird random blobby creature on a you know, a different colored planet that has weird blobby terrain. Like it's it just all feels very un unintentional. It's I think it's just really hard to do exploration in a way that is procedural exploration in a way that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, again, not saying it can't be done or there's not ways to incorporate it. It's just on the harder end of the spectrum. Um, whereas I think, you know, systems combat oriented stuff is more, uh, is like more in line with, um, with what, like what procedural generation strengths are. Mm -hmm. Well, Am I correct in uh, saying that you you come from a programming background, right? So, uh, uh, yes, yes. Okay. Um, so the next point is, you know, art background versus programming background, and what kind of game you should make with that background. But I think we can encapsulate this point into the next one, which is how much uh, visuals matter. Um, so, you obviously chose a low poly style for your game. Um, so I, I like to, I didn't coin this, but I like to use the term polygonal. Um, that's the sort of look that you have decided to go with, uh, for a, for a very, a varying amount of reasons, uh, you know, some of them obvious, um, you know, complexity, uh, time to do the work, uh, you know, performance, all of that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, basically just tell us a little bit about why you chose the art style that you did. And, you know, being a programmer, is it easier for someone to do a style that would be considered more simple, but that you can make look really good through some basic tools, you know, just basic post-processing can help a lot with polygonal art. Um, and how much do you think it's going to matter ultimately that you went with this style? Um, I think it's going to matter a lot in some maybe not obvious ways. I did get some pushback on the art style in Devlog 5. Um, so some people don't like it. Uh, that's fine. I think mostly I got I got more positive feedback than negative, I think. Um, some people just, you know, they, they prefer a realistic art style. Um, they're, like, what they want out of a war game is they want immersion in the sense of feeling like it's real, like realistic. Like, okay. they want all the details on the vehicles to be correct. Like, they might know a fair amount about military vehicles. And if something is used incorrectly or modeled incorrectly or functions incorrectly, it takes them out of the experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I, there are games that cater to that, you know, where it's like the authenticity is the main feature. Um, and I'm not doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. par partially, that's a knowledge issue. Um, I just... I don't know that much about like you have to be really detailed and into the, the the user manuals of all these vehicles and on the war thunder forums where they're leaking uh, classified information and stuff like that um i'm not at that level i i i'm not interested at that level okay um, but it's also so you know more than you know the interest of it it's also not practical for a single developer yeah and this is something that anyone that is a developer listening um that you do have to think about if you are if you want to make a call of duty clone then um you should scale that down and make a valorant clone and make it uh you know even more basic than valorant in terms of art um which is something that i think joe is doing well um but 
just because something has a basic art style doesn't mean it doesn't have to look good. And I do think you have gotten to a place where the art really does stand out. It, to me, it looks really good. And and I am an artist, you know, that's my, my I freelance as a 3D artist and I freelanced for some big companies in the past. And I think that your game looks really good. Thank you. Um, there's, I'm, I'm definitely in sort of a hodgepodge scenario right now where I don't have a consistent art style because consistency takes a lot of time mm -hmm. um, to like get everything to just be where it feels like it's cohesive. Um, so there are, there are, there are places where I look at the art that the game has right now, um, especially sort of when taken as a whole, like some of the screenshots, especially the ones I put on the steam page where it's like, wow, this looks really nice. But then if you like look too closely at some of the details, you're like, Hmm, that doesn't look right. You know, that doesn't look intentional. Why is that just a box? You know, <laughs> stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I mean, at so this point, it, you can play that off as prototype art, at least. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, I'm definitely not where I want to be yet in terms of cohesion. Mm -hmm. um, and as I mentioned earlier, I am starting to update some of the really early prototyping assets, like um, like the... The amphibious uh, uh, transport vehicle is literally just like a malformed tank that I kind of squished around until it was because uh, I just wanted something to I wanted to get working on the mechanics for amphibious vehicles, mm -hmm. but I didn't have an amphibious vehicle model and I didn't want to import one that wasn't mine. I didn't want to import something super high poly. So I'm like, all right, I'll just take the tank and mangle it until it's, you know, kind of the right shape. Okay. Uh, but it's bad. Like, it's not a good it's not a good it's not in a good intentional design. It's just that was what was quick and easy to do at the time. And then years later, I still have that that stupid model. So mm -hmm. I'm finally getting around to, um, you know, making not the final models, but like I'm sort of taking half steps towards the finish line. We got like mm -hmm. the cube. Like, what if everything was a cube here? The eventual future finish line. And then my first crack at the models was like, okay, they look like tanks. They don't look great, but you know, it's fine. And then what I'm doing now is sort of the next half step in between, which is like, it's a better tank. It's a better amphibious uh, transport. Uh, it's not maybe the final one, but it's ha it's halfway between the the start point and the finish point. So I kind of think of it that way. Um, and let's see, what else about the, um, the, the graphic style? Some people were a little bit confused and were, were thinking, oh, this is this is a temporary art style and it's going to go high res in the future. Mm -hmm. And that is just not what's going to happen. Um, okay. Like the art is going to improve. The models are going to improve. The look is going to improve, yeah. but it's not going to turn into a high res, high fidelity game. Mm -mm. That's just not how art game art works really, or at least not how I do it. Um, no, I mean, if you, if you had a gray box uh, level where it was obvious that that was going to that was going to be changed yeah. in the future that would be different but once you establish an art style usually you don't change it um yeah you yeah. make like if you, you make squint, improvements but you don't really change it yeah like if you squint right now at a screenshot of infinowar you'll probably see mostly what the finished game will look like mm -hmm. um the details will be different the you know the quality will improve quality in terms of like the craftsmanship not in terms of the resolution if that makes sense like i'm not gonna go high res i'm not gonna mm -hmm. go high poly um so the quality will improve in terms of craftsmanship yeah yeah I, do you think that um coming from a programming background had sort of influenced uh your decision in in the oh, yeah. direction a hundred percent and some of my early devlogs talk about like my early struggles with I was make making games or following tutorials, but I was kind of using the place the the art that was provided, and it just it made me really feel like oh this isn't my game this is someone else's game, because um, the art has such a such an important identity for the game mm -hmm. that I personally felt like if I wasn't making the art or if I didn't have a big hand in what the game looked like, then I wasn't really making the game. Now that's you could argue that that isn't true, and it probably isn't, but that's how I felt at least at the time when I was learning. So it was really important for me personally to get to a place where I felt like I could make something myself that I was proud of visually. And I'm not 100% there yet, but I am getting there. Um, and I do have a programmer back background. 
um, I liked art as a kid growing up. Like I would draw. Um, I, I kind of stopped that stuff a while back, and this is sort of me getting in touch again with, you know, I would I would draw like you know spaceships and vehicles and things like that. So this is a little bit of getting back in touch with that um, mm-hmm. that side of me after a long long break. Um, okay. But I think it is important for developers to lean into their strength. Yeah, um, definitely. In terms of like whether they're a programmer, whether they're an artist. There's one devlog that I follow. Um, I don't know if you've seen this one, Crimson Hollow. I can't remember the name of the uh, the developer who's making that, but she's a... I don't think... I could be wrong about this. I don't think she is or was a game developer before starting this, but she uh, was a prof- uh, professional artist. So, okay. like, beautiful, hand-drawn, everything. She's making this kind of cozy adventure game. Okay. Um, and the art is just... It's gorgeous. And she's leaning heavily into that for her devlogs and her game. Um, and I think that's important is to kind of identify your strength. Are you on the art side? Are you on the programmer side or something else? Music, um, you know, animation, something and lean heavily into that. Um, yeah. Do you, you want to have to pick up? Do you want to make just text based games? <laughs> yeah, you, you will need to shore up your weaknesses. Like I'm having to shore up the art side. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, in, so, in some ways, I'm kind of like equalizing them. I'm actually not that good of a programmer, um, but I'm good enough to um, kind of get by. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that is I think that is really important is to lean into your strength, um, lean into your strength more. Like if you're if you are not an artist, being an art first game is going to be tough. If you're not a programmer and you're like I'm going to make uh, you know, a game about programming where you program machines and mm. that's going to be tough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, programming can, even for simple games, it can leak into becoming tough pretty easily. Um, you know, most games now have inventory systems, but programming those are extremely hard. And I think new new developers sort of get into that trap quite easily. And then you sort of do tutorials as you as you develop and at some stage it just becomes it's not feasible to release the game anymore um so you do have to like like you said it's very important to know what you're good at and to focus on that thing now someone like myself that has been doing it for a very long time sort of has a little bit of everything um i would say i'm more art oriented but i'm also i it's important to know a lot about everything especially with the engine that you choose um, and you know performance and um, optimization of that performance is extremely important and that's why it's important to choose a, a visual style that makes sense um, like in your case something that probably on the programming side yes but on the art side wouldn't need that much optimization yeah that that was one of the reasons was what if I just made everything super low poly and have no textures? Because then I don't have to worry. Like any time I'm spending in the profiler, like debugging performance at this stage is just slowing down, getting word out about the game, getting features in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I want to get a sense of like how the game plays without having to optimize first. Now that's not saying that you can just totally ignore performance from the beginning and worry about making it fast later that can be a recipe for disaster as well um but cutting the corners where you can up front certainly helps Mm -hmm. and for your game specifically um you know the the note that i have is basically just what hardware are you targeting but i'm also curious uh are you looking at going to places like consoles? Are you looking at going to mobile? Um, and if so, what are your considerations for the optimization for those? Uh, right now, no. Um, I don't think I don't think anyone has really cracked the real time strategy game on a non PC mm-hmm. yet. I mean, I know there have been attempts. Um, I'm definitely a mouse and keyboard guy. Um, I I just think that that kind of game controls better on mouse and keyboard than it does on a controller. I don't like controllers personally. I don't like using them except in very specific, like if you're playing like a fighting game or something or like an isometric action game, like sure. Okay. Yeah. It works for that. Mm -hmm. Um, But like any kind of UI heavy game, um, you know, uh, you know, playing uh, Diablo on the uh, Diablo three on the PlayStation, 
Uh, really fun game to play, like control your character. Absolute nightmare in the menus, though. Like mm-hmm. an, an action RPG with all the menus, you know, skills and inventory and stuff on a controller is just a nightmare. And I mean, Blizzard did a great job, like a like a best in class job at making a controller based UI for that. But it still sucks. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, so I am not, and I do actually plan to have. Um, a fair amount of that type of stuff in the game, although we'll see how much exactly ends up in there. Uh, I did get people asking about targeting PC hardware targeting. Mm-hmm. Um, and right now I'm sort of, there's a number of ways to spend your performance budget as a developer. Um, one way is to, you know, go crisis style and just, you know, spend your performance budget on making the game look absolutely amazing and, you know, only the high-end rigs can run it or whatever. That's one way you can do it. Another way is you spend your performance budget conservatively and say, okay, I'm going to spend it on being able to run on absolute potato hardware. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's another option. Um, and People mostly think of it in, in terms of that spectrum, like potato to crisis. Um, but there's actually another dimension to it, which is like basically time to market. Like how quickly can I build this thing? How many... How many corners can I cut? How fast can I move as a developer and f- not squander the performance budget, but you're trading performance for not um, you're, you're trading performance for time, which yeah. is what I'm doing right now. Um, okay. So I am not currently targeting like the lowest end um, potato hardware. I'd like to get there eventually, but that's like a later problem. Um, mm-hmm. So right now I'm just saying, okay, all of my performance headroom is just going into, I can throw as many projectiles at the screen as I want to, and I don't need to worry about it because my rig runs it fine. <laughs> Will that work fine on like a 10-year-old laptop? Probably not. <clears throat> well, uh, I'm curious, what, what are your specs? Uh, I've, let's see. I bought this. I used to build my own PCs for the longest time, and then this last one... Um, I decided I'm too old and have too little time, and I just decided to buy a an off the shelf Corsair. Um, so what the heck even is it? I don't know. It was it was the good but still kind of cheap one. <laughs> yeah, but when you buy pre bolts, that can still be expensive. Um, oh yeah, it was it was expensive, but it was um... I, I got I got to the point where my time was more valuable than my money. So mm-hmm. I said, all right. Here you go, Corsair. <laughs> yeah, because it's. I'm. I'm always curious about this kind of stuff because up until this move to this new house, uh, I actually ran a PC building um, company mm-hmm. as well. So uh, it's very interesting to me um, as a game developer to see the sort of ratio of what PCs people are using. Because one thing that I realized is there are a lot more low budget PCs out there than you would think. Um, yeah. And I think you don't see that so much online because people aren't necessarily broadcasting their uh, specs when it is isn't top of the line stuff, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And this has been a big challenge for me in Operator 8 because um, it can, especially from a, you know, you would think art, but but from a programming point of view, it can become cumbersome pretty quickly um, to have to, yeah. to <clears throat> optimize things and you know, being a self-taught programmer, um, I don't necessarily always have the best steps to do something, um, and so it can be it can be a challenge to get that optimization going. But it's also very rewarding. Um, last week, I actually fixed the script and it added ten FPS to the game, and you know that kind of thing is very rewarding as well. So it's it's interesting to me to speak about these things because it's um, it's something that all developers really have to consider at the end of the day. Yeah, uh, and I did finally pull it up here. It's an uh, an RTX forty seventy and a um, a thirteenth gen Intel i seven thirty seven hundred K. So say, I think it's say it's not forty seventy. Uh, forty seventy. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's not a bad system at all. It's quite a yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like I said, it, it wasn't the like spend ten grand system. Like it wasn't the top end, but it was like. A, like a notch or two lower well, and well to, um, to, but it was to also on you, sale so to give you some perspective the um 
you know, I was going to say this about Steam as well previously, um, just this is way too late, but uh, just as an interesting note for everyone, the the um, conversion rate for wishlists on Steam is, is quite low. So it's interesting um, to actually check your conversion rate when it does release. So for most people, it's about, it varies a lot, but it, it can be as low as under 10%. Um, so it's interesting to me to to see how that, you know, how that converts, but um also keeping with steam um something that is interesting as well is that the most used graphics card on steam is a 3060 um so mm. okay that tracks yeah so if if the game runs well on a 4070 it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to run well on the average hardware um and like you said, if you wanted to run well on a 10 year old laptop that has a 1650 in it, then, you know, optimization becomes very necessary. So uh, just just to be clear, this is the new system. It's not that new anymore. It's like a year old. But I was developing the game on a much older system. Um, and I think that one was, I want to say it was a 1070, like 1070. So like yeah, several generations a, older. That's a good call to... Um to use for for performance testing yeah the main reason i upgraded was actually not the game it was video editing uh -huh. um because like rendering was taking a super long time and um my camera was recording in 4k my new not new anymore but new at the time um uh like real real camera not not recording with the phone anymore mm -hmm. uh, was recording 4k and just the video editor program was just choking on on rendering the 4k footage uh, or even like while i was editing it was really excuse me <clears throat> just like slow to respond kind of chugging and i eventually realized part of that was the ssd it was an older generation ssd mm -hmm. so anyway i mostly ended up upgrading not for the game but for the video stuff but okay. it helps for the game too because yeah <clears throat> Okay, well, you know, that's interesting to me. So it, it does seem like it'll run well, but, you know, to developers, just be mindful of this because uh, for Operator, it's been it's been a challenge, um, especially the, with the way that Unity handles rigid bodies. Now, I don't know if that affects you uh, specifically, but for me, it has been a big challenge. Um, and yeah. I've, I've had um, to do a lot of um, optimization programming. Yeah, I don't have that much going on with rigid bodies. There's a little bit, um, like vehicle wrecks and um, uh, stuff like that. Although I did end up disabling temporarily, um, like uh, trees trees falling over from getting destroyed by explosions, because that that has a bunch of like rigid body physics type type stuff going on, and yeah, um, yeah I was debugging performance. So anyway, mm -hmm. uh, there, there will be there will be some of that, but probably not nearly as much as you've got going on yeah yeah it's a different sort of game um so yeah i only have about 10 minutes left here so um let's get to the last okay, yeah. point and uh, then we'll we'll wrap up so um i assume your game isn't one that is going to have a ton of voice lines so for my game um for operator 8 uh it is the kind of game where there is quite a few um voice lines and and quite a few uh recording sessions happening for uh getting those sorts of things into the game um and something that i've been thinking about with uh with having all of this um you know these voice lines in the game is it's important for someone that is not a native english speaker to be able to enjoy this as well from a enjoyment perspective uh you know standpoint of just playing the game but also financially for myself um is this something that you've given any thought to um i hadn't well so there's sort of two sides to this one is the voiceover side and one is the localization side mm -hmm. um <clears throat> i think i'm actually i i want to have a lot of voiceover stuff in the game and not the like traditional here's a story being delivered by a character type stuff yeah but rts's have a surprising amount of or you know real-time tactics games have a surprising amount of audio in the form of unit responses and mm -hmm. just like prompts notifications things like that um where you know you don't want the unit to have one response when you move it because that gets super annoying mm -hmm. you don't even want it to have three because those same three get really annoying over and over you want it to have like 10 or more um mm -hmm. you want them to be contextual like 
Um, it's it's better if when the unit is not in combat, the response is sort of chill, maybe even bored sounding. But when they're in combat, they get more excited. It's you know it's more immersive that way. Um, you know responses for things like you know you're calling in an airstrike. Well, you um, to really sell the immersion, like you, you want to hear the crackle of the radio. You want that pilot calling in that you know you know they're inbound in ten seconds, and you know he, you know here's the uh, you know the payloads being delivered. You know that that type of stuff. Yeah, um, you know, getting the, the ra- all of a sudden one, the, you know, the radio one chatter, action yeah. needs forty voice lines. I- exactly. Like if I just go with kind of the world in conflict baseline, um, the like calling in an airstrike is there's a response, a voice response for uh, acknowledging that the strike was called. You need multiple variations of that. It's not the same every time. Otherwise, that'll get old and annoying. Um, there's a response for when the strike hits. Um, and there's it's contextual, so if you hit friendlies, there's a different voice line for that. If you hit enemies, there's a different voice line for that. If you hit nothing, there's a different voice line for that. Like, hey, who gave us these coordinates? Like, these are, you know, these coordinates were outdated last week. What's what's the deal? We did we hit nothing but dirt. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's different variations of all those. Um, yeah, and it then at least in the conflict, pretty quickly. There's there's three factions. So now you've got. Well, we've got the we've got to have a Russian guy do it. We've got to have an American guy do it. We've got to have a European guy do it, <laughs> uh, guy or gal. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, you start multiplying all that out, and you're like, "Holy crap!" This uh, you can actually go on YouTube, and there's like like uh, World in Conflict uh, tactical aid voiceover or something like that. Mm-hmm. And there's multiple videos that are just just the voice lines back to back, and it's like hours of of voice lines. Wow, that's um, crazy. I hadn't thought about it in that way, but you know, just the numbers adding up in my mind are crazy about what this would cost. Um, you know, if you, because you know, obviously, yeah. I don't know what your budget is, but for for me, um, you know, I have to. Uh, I don't have a, a recording studio or anything like that, but I hire people to do recordings, and if I had to do that, it would just be thousands of dollars. Oh yeah, it'll it'll be expensive, and that's where I like I haven't decided yet. Like, will I actually do unit responses? That'll be tough and a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely want to do at the very least responses for calling in like the tactical aids, the strikes, because they're they're very like impactful player moments. So I yeah. really want to highlight them, and I think the like the radio chatter that happens as a result adds to the ambiance like the the feeling of um, er, the immersive the immersive feeling of the game yeah so i think it's important and i want to do it one thing um well i could probably talk about this more some other time um one of the things that sort of stumbled into backwards there's a lot of things in this game that are like this where i just kind of by accident have something that's specific to this game that makes it easier for me to do than it might be for a different game and that's it's all over a radio so it can sound crackly, and mm-hmm. actually I have to apply a filter to make it crackly, so it doesn't need to be like a pristine audio recording on a pristine studio microphone in a pristine sound studio like most video game voiceover has to be. Yeah. Like You can literally just record it on your phone, and I'm going to pass it through a, a terrible um, uh, radio filter anyway, and all that stuff go- you know doesn't matter, goes away. Um, yeah. So just by virtue of the fact that all my voiceover is going to be over a crackly military radio uh, makes my process for recording the voiceover significantly easier. Yeah. Well, and that's sort of just an accident of like what the game needs. Like not every game can do that. That's true. Um, But outside of, you know, the game itself, audio and um, text, um, there is also, of course, the Steam page and your marketing resources. So have you given any thought into the localization for that? And, you know, this is something that most developers probably, you know, not I'm talking about indie developers, but most of them probably don't even give any thought to this kind of thing. You know, I hadn't really. It was more of like, a, well, I'll worry about that when the time comes. But mm-hmm. uh, as, as of the launch of my Steam page, like on day three or something like that, I got a big unexpected spike and I was checking the numbers and I was getting a surprising amount of traffic from Japan. Yeah. And I was just like, what is this? Why am I getting traffic from Japan? And it turns out that some Japanese Twitter like news aggregator or mm-hmm. um, gaming news aggregator had 
they must like scrape new steam pages or something like that and do posts about them yeah um it turned out that they made a post about the steam page and it got you know 25,000 views or something on twitter i had no idea this was happening mm -hmm. so for one day i had more traffic from japan than from the us which was <laughs> very yeah. surprising yeah um, I, I don't think people so, realize how big the asian markets are mm -hmm. so I, i'm thinking about it more um I started having to Google it because I'm like, well, I think traditional Japanese is written vertically, but I don't think they do that for, you know, text and games. So maybe it wouldn't be that hard. I don't know. <laughs> mm. So I, I'm definitely very ignorant in that in that area. Um, but it's something I'm now thinking about more just because and I, I've heard plenty of advice of like, hey, if you hit big in a country that, you know, somehow for some reason, there's a lot of fans of your game in that country, like do a localization you'd be surprised how um how valuable it can be so it's something yeah. i'm starting to think about because of incidents like uh like this or happy accidents yeah I guess. And that's probably going to happen more so you know to anyone that's listen listening that is a developer it is it is pretty important um i'm also working on getting the localized versions of my steam page uh, up and running and you know it's it's something that takes a, a couple of weeks to do but in the end it can be value it can be very valuable to you as a developer so uh, i would definitely say um go for it yeah localizing the steam page will be one thing localizing the game yeah but i do think you can separate another. those i don't <clears throat> think you necessarily have to localize the game if you know there is no indication of uh, a big spike in interest from another right, location right. but if you do have that you know it is also something to consider um but yeah um but okay uh, i'm pretty much out of time so um, okay yeah yeah this has been quite a interesting chat um we got off topic a lot but i do enjoy <laughs> i do enjoy doing that as well and i've i've learned a lot about your game which has been pretty interesting um i now understand it a little bit better and um i'm definitely going to keep following it um, I think we are set to do another recording um, at some point. So this is going to be the second out of three. Um, but from my side, it's been a lot of fun and uh, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, uh, here as well. Always, always a pleasure. Happy to do not to uh, happy to do another one mm -hmm. um, in the future. Yeah, it'll definitely be a lot so of fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. So um, I'm going to put Joe's game um, again in the uh in the uh section below and on the screen um and i'm gonna do the same for my game operator 8 so check us both out and um thanks for watching thanks take care all right cheers